Welcome everybody to Catfish Weekly presented by Catfish Clothing. Along with Cindy, I'm Lyle. Doc is traveling to Lake of the Ozarks. He's hopefully going to be joining us here in just a few minutes. Uh, talked to him a little while ago and he was about 30 or 45 minutes from the motel. So if he's got internet connection, he'll be coming on here and joining the show. Uh, welcome everybody. I see we got a bunch in the chat already. Thank you guys for watching Catfish Weekly. Um, there's a couple of things we need to talk about uh, before we get started with our guest. Uh, Leslie Finney uh, helped so much with the Mississippi River Monsters Tournament. Her brother is not doing too well. If you guys could please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. I know that Leslie would appreciate it. She does so much for all of us, and we need to make sure that we keep everything, uh, keep them in our thoughts and prayers. And um, as many of you know, we get a lot of people that come on through chat and donate a lot of things uh, while we're doing the show. And that's that's a wonderful thing. It helps us uh, have more prizes for people and, and offer you guys more stuff and uh, things like that. And one of the guys that has donated a lot of stuff uh, is Kenny McClure. And uh, when the uh, gentleman's boat burnt, and his building and another guy's build, but building burnt. Kenny was one of the guys that in, in helped us get things rolling to get this gentleman some help. And he contacted me the other day, and, and he got an overwhelming bunch of stuff, and it was great that, that everybody pitched in to help him. But the reason he called me was um, our good buddy Kenny's mother is not doing very good at all. And uh, they sent her home uh, and called in hospice to help them out to make her as comfortable in her final days as they can. And uh, Kenny's mother has no insurance, and they're having to take care of their of her there at their house. And anybody that can help with anything to help these guys ease some of the pain, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. They have a you you caring um, fund going. Uh, and Becky McClure can tell you all about it. If you go to their, their uh, You Caring page, you'll be able to find that uh, most people know that uh, the grandmother has been very ill in the past week, and the doctors told them, I believe this was yesterday, she will pass away within a week. The funeral home requires them to have a certain amount of money, and they're uh, struggling to make that happen. So if you guys could find it in your hearts to help them out, you can go to the You Care page. I believe it is in Becky's name, uh, Becky or Kenny, or send Becky a message uh, through Facebook and, and try to help them any way you can. Kenny has, has been instrumental along with Dustin and a bunch of them that has helped us along the way uh, when other people needed assistance. And uh, folks, this stuff could happen to any of us at any time uh, we recently been through that ourselves. So uh, if you can help these guys at all, I know that they would appreciate it a great deal. And uh, who's our buddy that was on the show here a while back? Cindy. Um, shoot. I can't remember his name. But anyhow, uh, he has a pretty good uh, rapport with the good big man upstairs. If he would say a uh, a blessing on Kenny and his family. We appreciate it very much. With that being said, Ted Ellensbecker, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, Lyle. Thanks for having me with you. Oh, dude, we we from the list since the last time you was on Catfish Weekly, we had so many people say, "Man, I wish you had him on for the entire show," and none of us really knew what to expect. But you've done such a great job, and and uh, when you contacted me here a while back about flathead seminar i knew we could really draw some attention and i knew that the stuff that you was going to be telling people was exactly what they need to hear or or want to hear or both probably both i think we've got some good information tonight <laughs> maybe a little more than they want lyle <laughs> that, that may be that may be now folks up before before ted gets started remember uh we appreciate all your likes and subscriptions and your shares and if we we're going to do a giveaway if we reach 150 sh uh, likes tonight so don't forget to do that all right ted how do, how do you want to start this well 
I should probably start talking, I think. Well, why don't I just thank you for letting me there and thank everybody else for joining us tonight to start with, and we'll take it from there. Uh, buddy, I'm, I'll tell you what, that, so. and I'm just going to let you do it, and in about 15 minutes, we'll cut in and spin the wheel, and other than that, you just have at it. All right. Thank you. Well, like I said, I, I want to thank everybody for joining us. we got a really unique group of people with us tonight. We've got some people that actually don't fish cats, but they're interested in the information. We've got some weekend warriors, of course. And yes, we do have some expert flatheaders, and that's wonderful. We also have a couple of fishery biologists that want some of this information. So with that said, we're going to just kind of dig, dig right into it. First off, in my opinion, flatheads are probably the most underestimated and misunderstood freshwater predator there is. And we're going to try to put a little bit of an end to that tonight. You know, uh, when you're fishing, the whole secret to success is making good decisions on the water. And the information tonight is going to be a little different. In fact, this whole seminar is going to be a little bit different than what I usually do. But if you understand, there's two areas when you're fishing that you really need to have knowledge. And one, of course, is the water. You, you need to understand how the water works and how the fish interact in the water. Tonight, though, we're talking about flatheads, and that's the other half. You need to know the species you're working on. You need to know them intimately, not just they like to eat minnows, but what makes them tick, and that's what we're calling this one tonight, what makes the flathead tick. The information you're going to get is going to help you make choices as we go. Now, some of the information may not, well, seem like it's necessary to start with, but when we get about three-quarters way into this, there's a little bit of information I'm going to give you on a research paper. It will tie everything together. So just follow along as we go. To start with, I know you guys that fish flatheads, you already know flatheads are very unique and special, right? They are to me too. But like I said, we have some beginners here. We actually have some people that don't fish flats, don't fish cats. So we're going to do a little quick comparison between blues and channels and flatheads, and we're going to establish just how different a flathead really is. We'll make it kind of quick and simple. But those of you that have fished channels and blues, if you look at a channel in a blue face on, you're looking straight on, you know, the head is basically circular, not like a ball, but basically round. The eyes are set on the side, but high. Okay, what this does is disperse sensing organs basically in a circular, circular pattern. And that fits. If you look at the jaw structure on a channel in a blue, they have an overbite. These fish are structured to pick up off the bottom, basically to pin their prey on the bottom or to strike from behind. Now, if you look at a flathead, here's where we start separating off. Obviously, if you look face on, the head is basically a flat oval. The <laughs> eyes are set up on top. And this fish has an underbite. And everybody goes, yeah, okay. Well, besides being a good handle to grab them with, what does all this mean? Okay. The head is top, the eyes are high. The sensory organs are up on top of the head and at the bottom of the head. The underbite, this fish is designed to take his prey from underneath and from straight behind. Separates him off the channel in the blue. So where does it put him? Well, what other apex predators have underbites? Muskie, northern pike, stripers, bass, walleye, all of the main freshwater predators are underbites. This is why a flathead is set off in his own genera. There's only one fish, genetically speaking, in this, in the flatheads group, and that is the flathead. But there's two other areas that are, that are important. One, now, it really doesn't affect you as a fisherman, but it's interesting, and I'm going to give it to you. If any of you are interested in trying to set regulations to protect big fish and you're in the nor northern area, uh, this information will help you. The flathead population has what's called a latitudinal counter gradient. Big words. What it means is that the northern population of flatheads can grow just as fast in length and weight as the southern population in flatheads. So if your fishery department says, well, the flatheads can't grow in this water, we're too far north as fast or as big, have them look up latitudinal counter gradient because they can't. 
okay? There's only two other fish species that carry this genetic trait, the northern pike and the striper. So again, we're separating the flatheads off. That's all we're doing right now. We're putting them in a group all by themselves. Now the second genetic encoding flatheads carry is important to you as an angler. And as we get deeper into this, you're gonna find out just how important it is. It will control decisions you make when you're on the water. And this is called high sight fidelity. High sight fidelity, uh, the easiest way to, to, to explain this, say you've got a nice little fat 10 pound flathead and he's living in a log jam on your medium sized river. If that log jam is there next summer, that flathead will come back to that log jam. If the log jam is gone, for whatever reason, it washes out or whatever, that flathead will still come back to that same area, usually within a mile upstream or a mile downstream of that area and claim another structure to live in. Okay, um, they had a test in, in the St. Louis River, a study that I wanna just explain how, how this actually works. Uh, the St. Louis River had two smaller tributaries that were flowing into it, but they're very close together. The department had tagged fish with electronic tracking devices in these two, <clears throat> excuse me, in these two tributaries. In the fall, when the fish moved out into the wintering grounds, they tracked them, and some of them obviously went into the St. Joe River, and they got mixed up. Some went north, some went south, and so they, but they wintered in, in the big river. In the spring, when they went back up into the tributaries, the fish that came out of tributary A went back into tributary A. The fish that came out of tributary B went back into tributary B. So this means something to you in your area and your water. And this is on the same on the reservoirs, the same on the lakes. These fish have ter territories that they will live in. They're a residential population. And we're going to explain this. This is probably raising some eyebrows right now but I'm gonna explain this all to you in detail, okay? Right now, before you go on, I'm gonna give you a scenario, and I want you to think about this as we go through the rest of this information, okay? Friday night, and for those of you that have fished flathead, you have done this, you have seen this. For those of you that haven't, well, just, just trust me, this happens quite a bit. Okay, Friday night, we're setting up, we're on a little river, and we'll just say a log jam. Maybe you fish riprap, that's fine. You're on a good structure, okay? But I'm just gonna talk log jam. So we, we set up on this log jam and I get there a little before dark because I like to set up before dark. So I get my rods out and I'm all comfy now. And about a half hour before sunset, I get my first bite. Now pay attention to this because this is gonna count. I get my first bite and this fish will probably be the most aggressive bite you get of the night for two reasons, three reasons possibly. One, this fish may be small. Now I'm not saying by aggressive, I'm not saying the biggest fish or the strongest, but just the aggressive bite. The fish possibly did not feed well the night before. Because of size restrictions, this fish may have a higher competition drive and genetically he just may be more aggressive. He is breaking cover early to go feed for whatever reason, okay? But anyway, so we got that fish, we got him ashore, we kiss him on the lips and we let him go. And now to save a little time, I'm just gonna say like, okay, every half hour, every 45 minutes, we catch another fish. Great, and we're talking back and forth, me and my fishing buddy and you and your fishing buddy, this is gonna be a great night, we're gonna pound them. And then about midnight, you get another bite and you catch a fish. Now here's where it changes, and you know this has happened. So now midnight, and the time is irrelevant. Could be 11, could be 11.30, midnight, 12.30, but in that area. You get another bite, you catch a fish. Now, 1.30 rolls around, you haven't had another bite. And you look at your 2 o'clock, you look at your buddy and you go, man, what happened? Well, they quit biting, right? Well, did they? That's the question. And here's where all this information is gonna boil down. Now, if you have a fishing buddy like I have, Jason Stansberry, you're out there, I know, thanks for joining us. He knows somebody 10 miles downstream that's fishing, so he calls them on the cell phone and says, hey, you know, buddy, what, how are they doing? And he tells you the same thing. We're doing real good till about 11 o'clock and they just quit on us. They quit biting. Okay. Now, we're going to sit there and you've been there before. So you go, okay, well, they're going to start biting again about five o'clock or five 30, right? 
Well, when the sun comes up, we're going to get a couple more bites. They're going to start biting again. This is wrong. These fish never stop biting. And we're going to explain what happens in just a little bit, okay? Now, the second one I'm going to talk to you about, it's not a scenario, just a statement I want you to think about as we go through this. If you've, if you've been at this for a while, like I have, I have gray hair, and Lyle, you got a little gray there too. But yeah, I do this. You know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, back in the day, like the 1990s, turn of the century, 2002, when the old timers, and I, and I'll, I got to say, I'm thankful I got to fish with most of them. But one thing they would always say about flatheads is you need big old wood. You guys ever heard that before? You need big old wood. And they're absolutely right. You do. But has anybody ever told you why? Huh. Okay. Well, we're going to tell you why in a little while. Okay. Because there is a reason big old wood. And it makes a difference. A big difference. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about season. But we're not going to get a lot into seasonal movements. But a little bit. And I just relate to a structure that came out of the Missouri Game and Fish Department. They did a study on the Missouri River. And now, you know, this can be argued, and I'm not going to say somebody's water can't change a little bit, okay? But this was a two-year study on the Missouri River. And they picked the Missouri River, <clears throat> excuse me, because on the section that they picked, the fish could move for 250 miles up north. They can move for 250 miles South, if they wanted to, they were unrestricted. And and as I'm sure you already well know, know well the uh, the big movements came in the fall, going to winter grounds. The big movement also came in the spring, coming out of winter grounds, going back to summer areas. And you guys also know if you're on certain bodies of water that in the spring local heroes are made because all the fish pile up below the low head dams. <laughs> but we're talking about when they settle into their summer area. Okay, flatheads move according to size. Little flatheads move a little, bigger flatheads move a lot, and I'm talking seasonally. In this study, there were 370, <clears throat> I don't remember exactly, 373, 374 flatheads, and, and all various sizes. Of that 370 some flatheads, one fish, and this is where people have been misled, one fish, moved about 100 miles, okay? And the only thing I'm going to comment about that fish is this. When they say he moved 100 miles is what they're meaning is from the area we tracked or we tagged him in to the area we discovered him later was 100 miles. Now, because there was only one fish, I have to ask the question, did that fish swim there? And here's what I mean. In South Dakota, we have a tournament on a little river uh, out of a park, and me and my buddy, we fish there, and, and we catch fish. And everybody takes off and goes where they want to fish. And we run about 70 miles south, and we fish, and then we, we live well fish, and we bring them back. Now, we do have to carry coolers with treated water. That's the only legal way to transport them. But when we come back with those fish, we're 70 miles north, and we release those fish at the wayside. So if I have a tagged fish, did he actually travel 100 miles or 70 miles? No, he didn't. You know, so I question the one fish. In this study, most of the big fish traveled 25 miles on the big runs or less. And the average was a little over 12 miles movement. Now, I'm talking all year. You know, I mean, the big run in the fall, the big run in the spring, average was 12 miles. In the summer, and this is... This I know because the Jim River in South Dakota, we've, we've checked them and we know what they do. This one says the same thing. And this is going to come down to you making decisions again here in a couple minutes. In the summer, not one flathead, regardless of size, moved more than one mile from the place he was originally tagged. And we're talking the summer season. So once they set up residence in a log jam or on the riprap or the wing dike or the rock pile or the point, his range, he's a resident fish. His range is within one mile north or south of that area for that summer period. And this isn't my opinion. A lot of guys are going, no, no, no. Well, that's what research says. 
And, and the reason a lot of people think differently about that is, is just because a lot of the information we have came from channels and blues, and they do travel like that. They travel a lot of miles. In fact, I, I talked to a guy that, while well, we were in a meeting talking about flathead regulations in the state of South Dakota, and I was talking about this, and when one of my buddies, and he's a, he's a good guy, he's my friend, he says, no, nope, you're wrong. Got it. We need to break here a minute. Let's let's do this. Ah, there you go. I right <laughs> well, alrighty then. <laughs> Before we spin the wheel, I want to go over something right quick that I had forgot at the beginning of the show. Um, with Kenny McClure's mother's situation, there will be a raffle uh, of three black horse rods and a basketball signed by Coach Cal for $20 per entry drawing. It ends Saturday. Uh, Kevin Hill, you can contact Kevin about that or Becky McClure, and they can give you the specifics. And we're going to draw the names out for that next week on Catfish Weekly. So be sure to sign up for that. And uh, remember, this is for the expense of Kenny's mother's funeral, and she has no insurance, so any help that you can do, we greatly appreciate it. All right. Now, we have the names all loaded up in random.org. And, Ted, if you give me a number between one and five, we're going to pick out a name. All right, let's go three. One, two, and three. And the winner is Tim Kruger, K-R-U-E-G-E-R. -E -E and let's see what Tim wins tonight. Well, I spin this. Explain to them what those numbers mean. They those numbers? About, yeah. The they numbers is about. how many times we hit the randomizer to generate the names. We tried doing it just once, and everybody liked it, doing it more than once. We can add some excitement to it, so that's that's why we do it more than once. It just adds a little dimension to the game. And the winner is Whisker Sticks LED Lights. Perfect. Tim, if you will contact Tim at Whisker Sticks Lights, he will hook you up some some of the best LED lights that are battery operated you'll ever see. They last forever. They're bright. It's just an awesome product, and uh, we thank him for being a sponsor on the Rig Rat Rocks Wheel. And Tim Kruger, you're the winner. Uh, Ted, we're ready for you to continue All right. on. Congratulations, Tim. Okay, I, do, I was saying about this big movement, everybody thinks, and, and channels and the blues do. Anyway, my buddy was talking. He went out on a road trip, and he stopped by a little dam called Rockport on the Jim River, and he saw a gentleman out there fishing, and he knew he was fishing cats uh, just because of the equipment he had out there, obviously. And so he went out and talked to him, and, and this guy had been there, living there for a long time, and, and they got talking about the movement, and this guy said, yeah, in the spring, you know, these fish come up from the Missouri River up to this dam, which is about, well, river miles, I'm going to guess around 100. Said, and, then in, and then when water goes down, they go back down the Missouri River. But when we get a big rain, they come back up. And I said, well, okay. Now, where did you get the data? Where, where's the re what was the research from? And he said, well, no, but the guy's lived there all his life. And his dad's lived there, and that's what they think. Well, they're partially right. Yes, the spring brings a big run and a good movement, and the high water will shuffle fish around. However, they are not coming up 100 miles from the Missouri River. Why is this important to you? Is what this tells us right off the bat. There are areas on a body of water then that can be fished out. So it's important to uh, take care of the big fish, guys. I guess that's all I have to say about that. And it also tells you why some bodies of water or some areas on rivers always seem to have good flatheads and some areas don't. It turns into a territorial situation. Okay, now I also promised we were going to do something kind of different tonight. We're going to do that right now, and then we're going to pull all this together with a bunch of glue. We're going to identify three structures that are flathead specific, and you'll find out why right after I do this. The first one, well, first to do this, this is a little different, and I don't think it's ever been done in public like this. First to do this, you have to have 
an agreement with languages. Your definition has to fit the dictionary, so to speak. And you also have to have research that backs it up. We have both. To start with, you, the first structure, and you probably all know what they are, but they've never been categorized like this, so we're just going to do it. And I want all you guys to be witness to it. You get to get in on writing a new page in the book on flatheads. So here <laughs> we go. The first structure is called the nursery. Now, according to dictionaries, a nursery is a place of care and or safety for young ones. So that kind of fits. Now, a nursery in our world of flathead fishing isn't really important to you because, well, I don't, unless you want to catch an aquarium fish, maybe. It is the smaller fish. It's the young guys. And it's also a completely different type of structure, so you should know about it, you know, because you're probably not going to catch a big fish on it. A nursery will look, the easiest way to describe it, a Christmas tree. You have very tight spaces, probably a little shallow water, sometimes root systems up underneath cut banks, rock piles. Now, I'm not talking big open riprap, but tighter rock piles, obviously, where smaller fish can get in. Okay, small wood branches, also green trees, fresh trees, which is just the opposite of the big old wood you want for the big flatheads, like a big cottonwood that tips over because the little, the little baby flatheads, they're looking for the bugs, they're looking for the moss that grows on those trees. It's a whole different environment. So that's the nursery, that's the first one. The second one is the structure you guys and I fish most often, and rightly so, but I, I have to tell you that we're missing out on it, okay? Remember the first scenario I gave you, the big one about, you know, they quit biting at midnight kind of thing, and they'll start again at five? Okay. This is called a staging structure. Now, they don't have staging structure in the dictionary, but a staging area is simply a stopping place or a place of assembly en route to another destination. Both of these definitions fit this structure. And in the next bit of research I'm gonna give you, you'll understand exactly why. The situation that we do on, on this structure, the staging structure, we pull up just like what I described. We fish, we catch some fish, we get a dead period, we catch a fish again in the morning, right? Remember that, okay? Now, the third one is called a feeding zone. Now, zone, by definition, is an area that's specialized in characteristics and in usage. And this is where the staging structure and the feeding zone come into play for you as a flathead fisherman. And I don't think this has ever been looked at this way, but we're going we're gonna to put up our big boy boots and we're going to wade right into this. So... <laughs> Yeah, we're going to. Okay, so there's your three. Now, there's your definitions, but what makes what makes them valuable? All right. This, this guys, I'm going to have to kind of read to you a little bit because, well, my gray matter just wouldn't memorize this information, but it's really important. Everything we've talked about right now gets glued together right here. Your ability to make decisions when you're fishing flatheads, you need to know this. You need to know these structures. You need to know this information. It will change the way you look at the water you fish. Okay, this was put together. This is called the DEAL movement, D-I-E-L. It's the habitat use of flatheads. Okay, it was put together by Purdue University and several other famous people and uh universities, but, okay, I'm just going to read this, otherwise I'm going to lose something. Okay, previous studies of movement and patterns and habitat use have determined the flathead cat is a highly developed sense of recognition and environment with extreme exhibition of a high degree of site fidelity to very specific habitats. Flathead catfish typically remain sedentary. They're not moving around. In aggregates of large woody debris, and riprap. Now, there's your two main elements in, in your bodies of water for, for adult flatheads. The results of these studies suggest the movement and habitat use patterns of flatheads vary within the deal period. Now, the deal period, guys, is a 24-hour watch on these tracked flatheads. What do they do 
every hour of this 24 hours. And this is going to, this is pretty cool. Flatheads were subsequently located during five 24 hour periods in July and August. So again, we're just talking summer period. And the water tempers are, you know, pretty warm. To describe the deal matter patterns of flatheads, coordinates of each fish were located within 24 hour periods and plotted on maps. Okay, so they understood exactly where they were traveling, exactly what they were doing. The results of this for you, flathead cats displayed limited movement over a relatively small deal range, which goes back to the no traveling over a mile in any body of water, any fish they've ever tracked I, during, you know, during the summer, okay? However, fish movement activity was significantly greater, and we already know this, during dusk, night, and dawn. With a median range, now here's where of 40 to 51 meters, that's all they're moving and on average. Obviously, some move out. The median total distance throughout the deal cycle was 72 meters. That was the total, out and back, okay? Two directions. Well, median deal range was 44 uh, meters in one direction. The median net displacement of tagged fish over the deal cycle was zero. Now what that means, well, we're gonna jump ahead here. When, I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. In addition, flathead cats utilize uh, gastric, uh, chemoreceptive and electroreceptive capabilities as a competitive advantage, which we already know. Scent and vibration, they pick it up, they're very sensitive, we already know that. The increased movement of flatheads during dusk, night, and dawn periods in the lower St. Joe and other bodies of water indicates these deal periods provide optimal forage opportunities for these species. Okay, they're doing this for a reason. Utilization of habitat was significantly different among the deal periods. During the day, the flats were found in large woody debris and riprap during 92% of the observations. The fish utilize open water habitats associated with sand, silt, gravel, and riffles. Uh, observation during night, dusk, and dawn periods. Water depth and flows usually stayed about the same. Uh, their hunting preference depth is under nine feet. Now, if you think about what we talked about the head on these flatheads, the receptors are on top and bottom. They like to strike up. If it's 20 foot deep, how are the flats gonna strike a fish? It's 20, 18 feet above their head. They can't sense him, they can't hit him. Under nine feet, it's just evolution. In nine feet, they become very effective hunters, nine foot and less, okay? They, the receptors pick up, they're capable of a strike. So it all makes sense, it all starts coming together. Uh, during, okay, flow rates less than, than a, half, a half a meter are common in the hunting zone. In other words, not, not real heavy, uh, you know, currents, but off to the sides of them. And flats did not utilize habitats in backwater areas with flow rates of less than, a, than 0.1 meter a minute. So in other words, these back areas where you got log jams piled up back in these muddy little bays, flatheads really don't care for them. You might have a nurseries area back there, but the big flats aren't going to go hunting back there very often. So what does all that mean to you? Okay, let's go back to our night period. We set up in front of that big log jam and they quit biting at midnight. Did they quit biting? No, they didn't. They moved out. They moved up into a feeding zone. Yep, you catch a fish again at five o'clock or so, you know, in the morning. Did they start biting again? No, they didn't. They're coming back into that staging area and you're just picking them up going out and picking them up coming back. And that makes sense, I believe, doesn't it? So now how do, we, how do we correct this? I mean, you know, I mean, I've been fishing that way for years, you know, and just kind of accepting it. And, and me and Jason last year, actually, we kind of played with this a bit and we found out that this made a difference. There are certain, well, okay, first, when this happens, some guys will go, well, I caught a fish at three o'clock and I caught a fish at 3.30. So what happened there? Well, to be honest with you, you probably had a couple of fish that were staging, maybe 30, 40, 50 yards downstream of the structure you're fishing, and they're just simply moving through. 
where were they where were they going well where do the guys put the the bank lines where do they, where do they put you know the limb lines up along the shallow banks right i mean how many big fish get caught on that type of a setup a lot of them and that's when those fish are moving up into those feeding zones I can't tell you exactly what a feeding zone is going to be as far as elements. I mean, is it going to be rock? Is it going to be whatever? Because I don't know your body of water. But what you're looking for, you have your staging structure and your setup on it. Here's how you combat this thing. Two ways. You have your staging structure. You set up on it. If you can find a staging structure that has a feeding zone within, a, say, 200 yards above it, by a feeding zone, it can be a lot of things. It can be a ripple. It can be a bank that has scattered uh, substrate on it, scattered branches, whatever. Anything that would collect bait fish, it's going to probably be shallower than the staging area. And these fish will come out. They'll move up this. They will work a pattern. And at sunrise, they come back into the staging area. That's just how they do it. The other way to get around it is if you can find a staging structure that has a lot of fingers to it. By that, I mean, you've got two, three, four, five log jams in a row, and you set up on the head log jam, the upstream log jam, is what you can achieve then is a movement all the way through those log jams for a longer period of time. The way I like to do it now is I set up until about say 10, 30, 11 o'clock, or when I think that bite has quit, and then I move, Jason and I move up to a feeding zone, and we pick up fish. We know sun's coming up in a half an hour, we move back to the staging zone, and we start picking up fish again. And as what that does is eliminate, it just simply eliminates that dead period for you. Now, like I said, a staging structure is the big deal for you, right? That's the big structure, the big riprap, big log jams. Can you fish it during the day? Absolutely. But what this information just told us, and a lot of people will, well, and here's where we make, where we, I used to make mistakes anyway. You'd set up above it and you'd put your bait out above, above this staging structure during the day. And you'd be lucky if you get a bite. The best way to do this, what I call slip and timber, you, you drift your boat up to the front and you place your bait in the openings right on the edge of the log jam. These fish are not going to move to you during the day, except in the spring, of course. We all know that. They're out there, and you can catch them all day long during the spring when they're on that spring feeding frenzy, basically. And then you move down to the next log jam and do the same thing. That's kind of the way that that's going to work. So you got ambushing on the big structures at night, moving to the feeding zone, and then, of course, you're slipping timber during the day where you have to go to the fish. Some guys have talked about or asked me about equipment. And if you ask my wife, she'll tell you I like equipment. So I have nothing against equipment when I say this. Okay. But equipment does not make you a better angler, guys. And I'm, I'm going to give it to you. You make the decisions. Equipment, equipment makes you a better prepared angler. Okay, a better armed angler. It makes you, you can cast further. You can do all the good things, right? So I have nothing against equipment. However, guys, with this information and your experience, okay, because I don't know everything you guys know either, you make the decision. I mean, think about it. You guys make the cast. You guys set the drag. You interpret what the electronics are going to tell you. You tie the knot, you pick the line, you pick the bait, you pick the body of water, you set the hook. Without you making the right decisions, how is all that great equipment do you any good? So you got to put the bait in front of the fish. And Lyle, I got done quicker than I thought. Heck I'm yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry about that, but that's about it. I, I kind of wanted to leave a little time for questions, and we got 20 minutes on the hour for that if you want to do that. Absolutely. We'll take questions before we do. Ah, there you go. <laughs> if you will give us a number, another number between one and five, we're going to give away some. Uh, two. One. I like them short numbers. Yeah, I thought you might. Two. 
And the number is Odina Carr, O-D-E-N-A Carr, C-A-R-R. -R. We will see what we can hook you up with. Mm -hmm. A bike light from Rig Wrap. So wow. if you will contact me after the show and send me your shipping information, we will get one of those out to you probably tomorrow. And uh, thanks for watching Catfish Weekly and playing the Rig Wrap Prize Wheel game. Ted, that was a wealth of information. I mean, just a ton of good quality stuff. Um, a lot of things that a lot of people don't ever think about. I hope so. I hope it helps. Oh, absolutely. I can't imagine that it won't help. Um, I have to go back tonight because the whole time if you're doing your, your visit, I'm getting uh, uh, I'm getting uh, messages and stuff, you know, and I'm trying to answer them and, and go through this stuff too. So I have to watch it again after we're done tonight. But um, I have a question here. Okay. Do you think that tag fish move more being tagged? Do I think fish move? More being tagged. Okay, so if the fish is tagged, do I think that would make him move more? No, I, I no, that's I what don't. I am assuming. That I don't either. I can't imagine okay. that would affect him in any way at all. No, I don't think so. In fact, the tags can't weigh more than uh, 0 0.02 percent of the total body weight of a fish, so it actually has no bearing, no weight, no weight bearing or consequence at all on the fish. Now. I don't remember where the last time I seen a tag catfish was, and I believe it was tagged in the fin. Is that correct? It depends on the types. They actually have some uh, sub subdermals that will go right under the skin, actually. Uh, they call them tracers. Uh, you have some that are like on the little wire that you'll see that are right behind the dorsal fin that they kind of poke an end into it. Um, yeah, there's there's several different types. Yeah, I I have I, the one I seen was from Missouri, of course, and I don't remember now uh, where it was. It seems to me like it was on the film, the uh, uh, on the fin, but you know it could it could have been something else. I know there's a lot of guys that uh, uh, would like to see or be able to tag fish, and and I'm one of them. I uh, as much as we fish, I think that it would be beneficial if we would. Um, if we was able to do that, but in Missouri, they will not allow it. I've tried two or three times and they just won't do it. Now I do uh, understand that there's going to be a tagging effort uh, in the Kansas area. So for some of them guys, that'd be some quality information that they can pass along to other people. Yep. And we have a tagging program starting actually this spring in South Dakota on flatheads also. Bottom dollar outdoors would like to know how can this information be adapted to flathead movement in large residues? How, okay, um, well, an, an example may be, in a, in a reservoir, I'm gonna assume you have a dam on the reservoir then, because it's a man, reservoir is a man-made body of water, so you've probably got a lot of rock up against the dam and probably deeper water. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm gonna assume that, the, that just painted that picture, the dam would probably be a wintering area. You have to understand when it comes to feeding zones, Flatheads really don't care about depth. They're more interested in the elements and where the fish are. You know, they don't necessarily need 50 foot of water or 60 foot of water, but that would make a wintering zone. I would think they would move off of there. Uh, you know, and most reservoirs don't go more than 12 or 20 miles. Some, you know, some do, but so they're going to move probably up into the areas. I would look for areas of, of heavy rock point within a few miles of that or within five miles of that. I would look for areas of incoming water, small tributaries coming in or whatever. We got some current flow, uh, uh, flooded timber on points, stuff like that. In the spring, they'll come off and they'll go up into those areas. Now, I don't know your body of water, so I, I can't specifically say, but that, that's where I would start looking. I wouldn't pay much attention to depth, though. I'd pay more attention to the structure itself. Right. That's, that's awesome. Uh, Dieter Melhorn would like to know, how long do you think a catfish will hold the tag before it expels it oh, depends on the structures he's holding obviously Dieter if, if they're holding in a, in a, in a rock structure where, with a lot of sharp edges they can pull a tag out real easy uh, if they go through like in Missouri if they go through the spawning season 
uh, with the tags. They lose some tags at that period of time just because they're getting kind of rough housed. Uh, other than that, they, they can hold them for a couple of years, you know, if, if, if they don't knock it out. I didn't know that they would ever lose one. But well, I guess they, they can. Yeah, I'm sure they could, but I just, yeah. you know, I, one of the greatest stories that I can share with you, and you can appreciate this, is uh, several years ago uh, doing some stuff with the conservation department in Missouri. They had tagged a fish between Chillicothe and Kansas City. And three years later, it was caught and called in below Memphis, Tennessee. Yep. So yep. That, that, my, my question about this, how many times did it make that trip? Did it make it once or did it make it once every year or a couple times a year? The only way you know that is if the guys tracking it were paying attention to it. Right. <laughs> but, exactly. but, a court, but, a, but according to, what was it a blue or a flathead or what was it? It was a blue, blue, it was cat. A blue cat. Okay, a, a blue cat's really kind of hard to tell because their pattern is totally different. I mean, for, for, for a blue to swim a couple hundred miles is not a big deal. They do that. And I don't think they're necessarily prone to coming back to the same area. So I think unless they were tracking the fish, I think it'd be hard to hard to say what was going on there. They're they're big they're big travelers, so it's yeah. not big for them them guys. Let me check see if we find any more uh, questions here. If you guys have any questions, now's the time. What's the deepest water you've ever caught flatheads in? The deepest water I've ever caught one in was uh, right about 32, 34 feet in a, in a man-made lake down in Nebraska. And But that 32, 34 feet had a whole bed of flooded timber in it, too. So, so on structure. Yep, yeah, yeah, All stumps. It was like they cut the trees out, and it was just a big stump field in about 32 foot of water. That, that sounds like a great spot for them. Uh, yeah. How does the current affect their movement? Uh, the current, okay, the current doesn't necessarily affect the movement, but it affects the positioning of the fish. You know, fish will move like in a reservoir with no current whatsoever. Uh, although an increased current, if that's what they're asking, an increased current will shuffle fish around and move them in the spring or middle of the summer, any time of year, if you increase fish. But what I look for the current more to do is position the fish along the edges, just like any other fish, you know, for, for positioning purposes. I, now, this is just my line of thinking, but I think that, as we know, if you catch fish in the current, they use the current to their advantage to fight to keep them being caught. And I believe that they also use that current, especially blues when they travel long distances. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. I, I'm a firm believer that they'll feed in one area and the next morning go somewhere else to rest. And I, do you think flatheads do that also? Yes. Yes, they do. Absolutely. And, and that's kind of what we were talking about before. And, and one example is just we were talking about the, the, the log jam that we fish. And that is it's a steady current, but it's a quiet current. And we have a feeding zone about 75 yards upstream from there where, where the river is compressed or narrowed down. So we have some really nice current lines and faster water. And, and it, it's real evident that those flats come out of there, they move up into that area, and they actually use that current along those edges to, to kind of confuse the bait fish, I think. The, the big flats can hold their position right at the base of the rocks, and the bait fish get kind of swirled around a little bit, and they just sit under there and pick them up. That's what I think, so. That could very well be it. Uh, about where do they hold on a wing dike at the base or the travel the face? Ooh, thanks for the question. <laughs> we didn't talk about wing dikes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> wing, wing dikes are good. And oh boy. Okay. Whoever asked that, can I ask you to stand right now on the tip of your wing dike facing downstream? Okay. We're just going to kind of dissect this wing dike real quick. I do fish rivers too. Uh, um, okay, you're standing on the end of the tip of the wing dike. So right off about 11 o'clock, right in front of you, you got the big washout hole, right? I mean, you know, where the, where the water comes bail around the nose of the wing dike and washes the big hole out. And most guys walk right up there and they want to throw their bait right into that deep water. And you don't do that. Okay, now if you go right to your right down the face of that wing dike, depending on the wing dike, you should have some big rock, some big rickrap type 
maybe even some bridge pillars or some pylons along the front of there. That's an excellent place. A little faster current and a little harder to fish. The optimum place on that wing dike is going to be where that water coming around the tip and the water coming across the face. You know how it swirls around inside those wing dikes and comes back out to the tip? Where that water coming out and coming down the tip meet, converge, and make that turn to go downstream. But don't cast out to the edge of that deal. Keep the bait right at the base of those rocks, right at the base of the rocks. You don't need to cast a 50 yard cast. The fish that are active and hunting are gonna come right up to that seam and they're gonna sit right at the base of those rocks. If that doesn't work, if you go further to your right towards the bank, normally that little corner area will pile up some trees, some branch, you know, some logs or whatever where the current just runs right into the butt end of that wing dike. And that area will hold some fish right on the inside edge as well. That's my opinion. If you go straight off, straight downstream from a wing dike, depending on the wing dike how far, but usually about 30 or 40 yards, you, there's usually a mud hump right in the middle of the river there where everything kind of swirls around and settles up. If you have some other elements there, again, like sunken logs or, or maybe somebody's old garage, you know, anything piled up on there, even if it's only three or four feet deep, that water stays oxygenated because of the flow flats will hold in on top of that hump. But what, but that would be a staging structure. When they come off of there, they're going to move right up to the face of that dam. Most people are not aggressive enough when they fish flats. They're really not. You need to move right up into that tight area. Target them. Put it right on the bullseye. That's perfect That's information. Did I, did I answer that one? <laughs> okay. Awesome. It really was. Uh, Tim with Whisker Sticks would like to know if flatheads have a typical hunting route. He has always understood they have a circular route and return back where they started. Absolutely. We just covered it. And, and I could, I'll give you a quick example of just how exact that gets. I told you about Jason Stansbury, my buddy. He's watching, so I, I got to say hi to him. Hey, bud. Um, okay. I understand when I say this. 50-pound flatheads on our river up here are, well, rare, very rare, okay? I've seen three in 20 years. I have one, Jason has two. But Jason caught one two years ago, well, like two years ago, and it was like 48 pounds. And he has this little structure on this pillar. Long story short, a year later, the same week, the same pillar, the bait within probably 12 inches of that same positioning area, he takes a 50 pounder right there. Now that fish, we didn't have him tagged up or anything else, but because I know that I've caught 150 out of that river in 45 years fishing it. Okay. So they're rare for him to do one there last year, one there the next year in the same spot within 12 inches, knowing their high sight fidelity. I think that was the same fish. And yes, the gentleman that just discussed the movement, the circular pattern, he's absolutely correct. Awesome. There, there you go, Tim. Uh, Yakin with Sarah would like to know if you catch a tag fish, what should you look for? Uh, can you describe the tags of the ones that's, that uh, are used commonly? Uh, normally, normally it'll look like, well, if, if it's the one that has the little prong that sticks in the side of the fish, which is the usual type. Uh, it'll look like a, a very short, oh, just a little stick almost, and there'll be some numbers on the side. All you have to do is call the Game Fish and Parks Department, give them the number, be some very small numbers on the side of that, and they'll know exactly what kind of fish it is, exactly where it came from. They will want to know where you caught it. You won't have to give them the fish. You don't have to give them any other information, but they do – to do them any good, they have to know where you caught the fish. And you can keep the fish if you want, but you, you've got to let them know and tell them where you caught it. That's right. And that and that is quality information. Uh, and those are the same ones that I've seen in the past. But those those are uh, – that's information that they do to determine whether we need regulations on different bodies of water. It tells them about growth and, and patterns of fish and different things. And any time you catch a tag fish – whether you harvest the fish or not, be sure to contact whoever the tagging person is 
so that they can record that and use that information for the, the regulations that we all love. Yeah, Pete, please, please do. Yeah, PD Fishing says they have a little river with lots of logs and brush, two to 14 feet. How deep would you fish? Uh, okay, loaded question. I would fish where the fish are. No, I'm sorry, can't say that. <laughs> uh, first off, I, I would try to find obviously a good structure where more than one element come together. We've talked about this in the past, Lyle, where more than one element comes together. Uh, if you've got a current coming up against the face of the log jam, that's better than just a quiet log jam. Try to put some things together. Again, I don't pay much attention uh, to depth. I mean, if it's four feet deep, it's deep enough If you, in, a, in a small river, if you have everything else going for it. And that would be a complex structure. If you have the current coming up against the log jam, and again, if that log jam is old, if it's been there a while, then the current has had an opportunity to actually make cutouts against the bank and cutouts under the logs. So it turns into a little city there. So again, big old wood and connect it to the current, connect it to the channel. If you can take a log jam, you said a lot of, I wouldn't fish a single tree necessarily, unless it's all you have. But if you got a log jam and it's connected to the bank and the water's pushing up against the front and the front of that log jam hangs over the, the, the channel in that creek or that little river, you know, you wanna pay attention to it. Cause then you've got, you've got a couple different areas. You can have washouts on the bank, potentially washouts on the face of that log jam. And then you got the channel itself. That's, that's, that's some great advice. Uh, bottom dollar outdoors, did the study reveal when fish fed better on a rise or fall in the river level? Water levels were, water levels were not, um, we're not studied in that particular study, but in my opinion, if that's worth anything to you, I would fish on, on a climbing water because there's more. What happens when you have a, a not, and I'm not talking flood water, but when you've got just a rising water, you've got a lot of night crawlers, you've got a lot of food coming into the river, and that does, it triggers two things. You've got the increase in current, it triggers some movement. Like we said, it shuffles fish. It also puts feed in the water and gets them fired up. So I would say a slight rise, I, I would pick a slight rise. Me too, every time. Yeah. Uh, Patriot dredgers and catfishers would like to know, do flatheads and river flathead, do lake flatheads and river flatheads act differently? Um, not really, no. Uh, forage preferences are gonna obviously depend on the body of water, what's available. Uh, I prefer live baits. Flathead, at least adult flatheads or meat eaters, they prefer a live bait. They will take cut baits. I mean, I'm not going to say they won't, but they prefer a live. Um, they will still move in a seasonal pattern uh, fr from the summer area, like a staging area, to the wintering hole in the lake, which could be just an old creek channel in the lake or maybe an old road ditch or the dam. Um, so, no, they really don't. They usually move a little less because you don't have increases and drops in current volume, but they will still make the same kind of moves. Yeah, I, a flathead's a flathead. It doesn't matter if he's in a lake or a river. No. Eat and it's just pretty much cut and yep. drop. Yep, yep. David Funk would like to know, with a flathead feeding looking up, how do you suspend your bait? Do you use a bobber or maybe a drift rig with a float? Okay. Um, Good question. Depends what you're fishing. Like if I'm like I described slip and timber where I'm fishing into the, the holes in the front of log jams as an example. I'll be honest, I fish completely vertical right off the side of the boat. I'll drop the bait down to the bottom and I'll give it two cranks on the rod. And, and even if I only got five foot of line out, that's the way I'll fish that. So I just fish vertical. If you're fishing like off the river banks, um, the best thing you can do is a live bait so it has the vibration. The flats will still pick up off the bottom. I mean, obviously we all catch flats on the bottom, but is what you want to do then is make sure that your bait, because flats will cruise off the bottom, eight, 12 inches off. You want to make sure your bait's lively. Another thing you can do to help yourself out a little bit is if you anal hook them right ahead of the anal pour instead of the dorsal fin is what that does when the fish pulls up to swim the hook holds the tail down and the head up. So he will come off the bottom about eight or 10 inches of when he wigs his tail. If you trim the top fin half off, it just gives him more propulsion up. 
But the big thing would be to have good live bait and don't use a hook that's too big a diameter because all it does is injure your bait and they slow down on you. Yep, that's that's 100% correct. Uh, inside of the full moon theory, good or bad at night or f for flatheads? Is the full moon good or bad? Mm -hmm. um, um, hmm. Well, I'm going to have to claim being naive. I honestly don't know. I know I prefer the full moon. I catch them on full moon. I don't believe, in, at least in the water I fish, if the light from a full moon, I don't believe it penetrates more than a foot and a half. You know, um, I mean, the water is just that turbid. It, it, it just doesn't penetrate. I don't believe the fact that they feed in the spring 24 hours a day, bright sunlight, I don't believe light is the kind of factor that at night that's going to shut them off. I, I don't believe so. I don't either. They're an eating machine, and they're going to eat when they need to eat, and they're going to continue to do so until they've had all they want. That's right. Yep. Uh, let's see. On our small rivers during the summer when the water is low and hot, uh, Jacob Taggett says he fishes areas with heavy current. Would that have higher oxygen levels? It seems to work for him, and it's the same in large waters. Okay, yeah, that's kind of a combination. I, I got to give you a combination answer on that. It, it does a couple of things. Um, to say that the oxygen level is higher there, it, boy, that's, it depends on the river for sure. But if, if you picture what the water is doing in a river with a high flow, if you put your hand in a sink full of water with cold water on the bottom and the hot water on top, and, and you shake your hand up, you stir it up, it's all the same. And a river is continually moving. It's, it's just continually mixing, continually moving. Temperatures don't change a lot from top to bottom. I don't believe that the oxygen level itself would change a lot in fast water. Now, right below rapids, you would have a higher oxygen level, okay? Because the water is coming into a lot of air contact and mixing, just like a big aerator. That it would. But in just a straight shot, a river is what a current does do is pass more water over the gills on a flathead, and he doesn't have to work to get it. He can face into the current and breathe, and every time he takes a breath and opens his gills, the river itself is pushing more water volume. So it will help a flathead that way. So I, I don't doubt what he's saying <laughs> at all. But I don't think their oxygen level itself is that, that different. Right. The only, the only place that I personally would think that oxygen is created in a river other than the natural flow of the river is below dams. Mm -hmm. uh, dams yep. produce a lot of oxygen. I think that's part of the reason why a lot of bait is up there which in turn brings the flatheads, blues, and every other species uh, up there to feed um, because the bait's going to hang around. If the bait's going to be there, then other guys will come. Yep, absolutely. You're right. Yep. Just like the big rapids or the dams where that water is really churning up and getting a lot of air contact. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, and, and uh, certain times are better than other times. Uh, at any type of structure like that that produces oxygen, uh, and it determines on how much bait is actually going to be in those areas. Yes, it does. Yep. All right. Anybody else got any questions? Man, Ted, you have thrown out some really awesome information. I can't believe that these guys ain't going driving you nuts with this stuff. That's okay. It, um, Sonny Parker would like to know if you have a sample of the rig you use for flatheads. Yep, I can give them both to you. Well, I don't have one tied up, but I can tell them both to you. Well, I use three. Okay. I use, I use a, a heavy uh, weedless bass jig for fishing vertical into the log jams. Well, you know, it has the weedless, like mm -hmm. weedless hairs that come up. If necessary, I'll put an ounce and a half, two ounce or four ounce weight right ahead of that to get it down if I have to. Um, so that would be a vertical presentation. If I can, I have some areas off the currents where I do fish a slip bobber. Uh, I love flatheads on slip bobbers. If I got a quiet strip going by a big log jam and I can drift a big bullhead across the front of that log jam on a slip bobber, 18 inches foot off the bottom, I love it. Other than that, it's a simple slip rig. You have the hook, your leader, a snap swivel or a swivel, and your sinker above it. That, that's just kind of 95% of the time that's your go-to rig. It's just nice and simple. 
uh, Bobby Vargas wants to know when volume two of any fish, any water is coming out. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> That's great. Shit. That's great information out there. Yeah. That, that video will actually be coming out uh, this fall. We've already started. We've got some footage in the can and I'm not going to let it out like this, but, but we're going to start a seat. We're going to start a species specific. Now we have, we have the foundation video out. So now the species specific, theory of threes and any fish, any waters will be following. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Tim with whisker sticks would like to know if you have any speculation on how often flatheads might eat on juvenile turtles. He says he understands that's a random question, but he's curious about it. Well, I think if I was, well, I think if a 20 pound flat or whatever, 10 pound, 20 pound flathead was sitting there and a six inch painted turtle bumped him in the nose, I think that turtle would probably get eaten. I, I think you're right. <laughs> They're I, not I, a feeder. I don't know if they go hunting for him very much, but if he gets in the way, I, I think any flathead that, that is a, you know, I, I, I just think they'd eat him if he, yeah. If he had the opportunity, they'd eat him. Yeah, I, I've always been a firm believer that blues will will eat something, not necessarily because they're hungry. If it's around them, they will kill it just because it's around them. And flatheads, in my opinion, if it moves, they're going to eat it. Yes, they are. If it, yeah. if, it, if it gets in the way, they're just, they're just going to take it on. That's the way that's, they are. That's right. Junior Proctor would like to know if you think bright lights on a boat affect the bite of flatheads. Hey, Junior. Um, thanks for the question. I, I do, well, depends on the water, okay? I, I think obviously we know lights do affect fish i mean you can put lights over the boat and attract uh, well you don't actually attract the crappies but you attract the freshwater shrimp and then the crappies come in on them and the minnows and all that kind of thing so lights do affect fish um on, on a real turbid river you know where you got a lot of mud in that water depending on how bright you're talking if you're talking floodlights i mean you know or spotlights yeah you can spook a fish with a spotlight of course but like your boat lights I, I use lanterns, Junior, all the time. I mean, I do a lot of bank fishing with my friends and my daughters, and, and I use lanterns. I like to see what I'm doing, and, I, and I'll be honest with you. I catch quite a few fish, I don't, so, I, you know. But, again, the water I do fish is dark water. I, I don't think that those lantern lights, you know, they're glancing off. I don't think they're penetrating more than a couple of feet. I don't, especially in, in the, the – now, they, it might in some of the lakes where we fish, but sure. the rivers, the Mississippi and Missouri River, yeah. I'd be surprised if you could see three foot any direction if you're underwater. That's just my opinion. That, that's, that's what I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, trying to, oh, Rick Montoya wants to know where he can find part one. So this might be a really good time for you to tell everybody <laughs> where to find all your information and stuff. Okay, I, I get to do an ad here, huh? <laughs> okay, yeah, the video, Any Fish, Any Water, been doing real good. And, guys, that is, just so you know, that is an all-species video. It, it, it's a structure video, okay? And it is, quite honestly, the most comprehensive structure study you're going to find. You will understand what makes a structure work. Uh, it is available on eBay. It is available. I like sending people to Amazon. You can purchase it as a download on Amazon. You can purchase a DVD. You can purchase a flash drive, or you can simply rent it, and that's the cheapest way to go. Um, we do have a website that will actually be live in about 10 days uh, with also some other product, but we won't get into that right now. So anyway, uh, Amazon or eBay for the video, and, and I do honestly recommend it. It's and, and here's the thing. Yes, I do want to sell some. Yes, I do want, you know, I like the money. But, but I do ask people, if you do watch the video, any fish, any water, share the information with your friends, okay? Because important, it is important. It's good stuff. It worked. So people know, since I do have an audience here, when we were developing this video and, and actually testing this video, and I don't think Lyle even knows this, during the testing and development of the video, we have set over 50 line class records, and that's multi-species. So this stuff is proven. This isn't just opinionated. And it took us 10 years to put this information together before I would say this works. You know, when you start something like that, you go, oh, this is neat. This is cool. This is pretty neat. But it just turned into a monster and it works. And all of a sudden it turned into a big deal. And it will write the book on fishing structure eventually. 
So anyway, awesome. there you go, guys. You know, and, and I'm very proud of our conservation department in Missouri. They'll spend usually a minimum of five years doing surveys to determine if we need regulations for this or that before they ever make any kind of decision. It gets a little disheartening while you're waiting on those to be done. But they try yep. well. But yep. now that's a five-year program. What you're talking about is five years beyond that to make sure you got it right. Yep. Yeah, the, the first, actually in the video, the first footage in the video was filmed in 2002. The first time I mentioned the theory of three and selecting elements to place together on the Red River in Manitoba. Wow. Uh, in 2002. And that's in the video. And, but the whole thing is mentioned at that point. And we finished it in 2016. That's a long time. So, so, so that, but, but see now, while I can look at you and go, that works. Yep. You know, and be sure that it's correct. Uh, man, right. I, I got to tell you, I appreciate all the stuff that you do, and and especially coming on the show and, and sharing so much of this information with us, because I, I along with many others, have been enlightened on a lot of things that that I didn't, and, and I would love to be watching them expression on doc's face as he watches this video because he's a flathead fanatic yep. so he's really going to get some benefit out of some of this stuff Dieter bellhorn would like to know do you believe that reservoir flatheads live and should be fished differently than river flatheads um should Dieter, are you talking can can Dieter ask another question with this Dieter? or not does that work or not um i don't i don't know if he means um like structure wise or rig wise or bait wise or if they should be fished differently uh you could drift over structures you know i, I like drifting on big reservoirs if i get like a stump field like i like you asked on that one what deepest water and i told you about the stump field uh -huh. we, can, we can drift that with baits you know where you're bouncing baits off the bottom just a little bit live baits and you pick up fish so drifting is a good idea. Uh, vertical fishing, slip bobbers, if it's not too too wavy or too you know too rough. Um, if it's wavy, while we're talking structures, Dieter, I know you're you're a heck of a fisherman yourself. So I'm not I, you know I'm probably not telling you anything. But if you got a reservoir and you're trying to decide what type of structures or elements to use on that reservoir, you know a, a good wind will help you decide what side of the lake to go to. Obviously, if you have structures on that side. Because uh, that'll push your bait, and you know all this already, Dieter. So I don't know, but that'll push the bait over. But other, some people don't. That'll push the bait over to that shoreline, and so the structures on, that, especially if that wind's been out of the same direction for two, three days. So other than that, same rigs, as far as I am concerned. I would add drift fishing uh, to the sequence on a reservoir lake, though. I hope that answered his question. I think you got really close. Rod Wise would like to know if you prefer circle or kale hooks when you're fishing for flatheads. Well, considering I market my own hook, I <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have to, I don't like either one of those. No, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> no I'm just kidding. Um, the, the type of hook to use, guys, and, and here's where the equipment comes in again, and I, I, I don't – every hook on a market will catch a fish. How do you want to fish with it? And what si more importantly, rather than the brand of the hook or all of that, I would suggest you make sure you size whatever hook you use so it fits the bait you're using so the tip doesn't obstruct the hook set and so it fits the size fish you're fishing for. Other than that, if you like circle hooks, use them. If you like, if you like a kale hook, use it. If you like an Eagle Claw 084 bait hook, use it. Just adjust that size of that hook. Make sure your tip's sharp and adjust it to fit your bait and fit the fish you're going to encounter. I agree. I think a lot of people um, don't use a hook that's designed to catch certain size fish. They either have one too big or too small. And again, that also relates to the size of bait they're using. Yep. Exactly. And why they, or they place the hook on the bait, live or cut, doesn't make a difference. If you don't put it where it's not going to, be effective when the, when the fish hit it, it's not doing you any good. That's right. Yep. Big C Catfishing says he fishes a lake with a, with a that has little structure and is only 10 to 16 foot deep anywhere in the lake. Where would flat hit be? Okay. Well, with little structure, actually, you got it kind of easy. 
If you have very little structure, you just pinpointed where you want to be. Now on a small lake, I'm going to assume if it's only 10 to 16 foot deep, you're also going to add weed lines in there. Uh, flats on some lakes will take up cover in weed lines, especially bull rushes that run out to eight or 10 feet. Um, they ambush just like a northern pike will ambush coming out of there. However, uh, on a small lake, if you have a point, if you can find a tree on that point or some rock on that point, or possibly if it's man-made, an old roadbed that's submerged, um, that would work. When you say a little structure, you know, again, trees or rock are your best element to try to locate. But if you can't in a small, shallow lake like that, I would look look for a good weed line as in relation to a point or another element, I guess. I hope that helped a little bit. I think it would. I have a, a message on Facebook from Stephen Woolley. He would like to know, he says he missed part of the show, but he would like to know what your favorite bait is to use on a river. Uh, for flatheads, bullheads. I, I love bullheads, and I don't know... You know, I, I think it's kind of a combination thing. Obviously, the flats eat them because a lot of them have swallowed them. But when they hit a bullhead, I think it's almost a territorial thing. Maybe it goes back to the spawning deal where bullheads go in and eat the eggs. Or maybe it's a cannibalistic thing where they think it's a little flathead. On the other side of the coin, bullheads do not die. If you want live bait, they are extremely durable. I yes, mean, you they are. You know, you, you can put one on a hook. If you don't get a bite, he'll be alive four hours later. Oh, yeah. They're, they're tougher you know. than I'll get out. Yeah. But I, I've had some really spectacular hits on, on live bullheads. So I would say that's my favorite. Now, I'm going to clarify this a little bit. You have to understand where I fish, mostly where I fish. <laughs> Let's do it. Cindy has a new new job. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> All right, can you uh, pick me out another number? Uh, let's go with, oh, let's go with four. One, two, three. Whoop, I didn't hit that right. And four. And the winner is Jake Hatter, H-A-T-T-E-R. And let's give Jake a spin and see what we did for him tonight. I will squeeze that up so you wouldn't be scared. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mud Bum Supply Shack. Mud nice. Supply nice. Shack. Yes, it is. Jake, if you will contact uh, Mud Bum Supply Shack and tell them that you won a prize on the Catfish Weekly Prize Wheel game with from Rig Wrap. They will hook you up with, I believe, a $25 gift certificate, and I will let them know after the show that you are the winner and will be contacting them. Thanks for watching Catfish Weekly and playing our Rig Rat Prize Wheel game. All right, Ted, I, I hope that you are not done. I'm still getting questions. I'm good. If you want to keep going, I'm good. I'm hey, here, to talk, here to talk to people. Absolutely. We handled that one on favorite, thing, favorite bait. Uh... Uh, Tim says he has a three acre lake that's a maximum of five foot deep um, multiple channel cat and flat ups up to 30 pounds no cover just one big mud flap any tips well, if you have a wind you're going to want to go to the shoreline the wind's beating on that, that's just bottom line if you got no cover then you got to go with another element that affects the positioning of the fish. And in your case, if there's no structure, it's going to be the wind. Or shade. If you have some sort of shade over one bank and it's 100 degrees and you got shade, I would go to the shade or the wind. Absolutely. Mike Sampson would like to know flatheads like 100-foot depth water. My opinion? No. Just no. I mean, if think about it. 100-foot water. How many bait fish are you going to have in 100-foot water? Very few. Very few. And how many, what's your oxygen level on your, on your, you know, on your thermal? It's really levels. low down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There. So, yeah, so no, I, I really don't go to deep water for flats. I really don't. All right. What about S-O-L-T-Y? Have you ever used selfies? I'm not. S-O-L-T-Y? 
Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Jerry Montgomery, yeah, I don't know if your spelling's off or I just don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Now, okay, Magic Bait has a deal called Salty, S A L T Y. Um, I'm not sure what he's. Um, yeah. Okay, okay, I, I'm gonna have to apologize. I'm not sure what what. Yeah, I'm not either. Okay. Uh, would you clip the fins on a bullhead? Uh, I do just for self protection. <laughs> I understand. You know? Yeah, just for self protection. When I when they go in a bait bucket, I like I don't clip them all the way up to the body because I again I don't want to take the endurance out of the fish, but I will take them halfway down, take the tips off them, dull them down a bit. Otherwise, I end up screaming a lot at night and saying That's words right. I sh saying words I shouldn't say and stuff. And them so. things hurt, but man, they'll sting you in a heartbeat. And yeah, uh, yeah, take that. Just take the point off of them and. Uh, it's yep. self-preservation more than anything. Yep, exactly. Yep. The flatheads now just to, to go a little more with that. The flatheads don't care. Nope. If you don't, if you don't want to trim the <clears throat> trim the fins on them, the flatheads don't care. It won't make a difference to them. But I like to just like I say, just so in the dark, I'm not getting stabbed in the palm of the hand. <laughs> That's exactly right. What's the best lund boat for catfishing, in your opinion? Oh, the best lund boat. Well, I guess I'd have, I'm prejudiced. I'd say a Pro V is the best lawn there is, period. <laughs> but, but you know, boy, I'm not even going to – well, okay, I'd say the Pro V uh, in a lawn just because I've, I've had a couple and, and I, I just am thoroughly sold on them. But you don't have to have a boat like that to go catfishing either, guys. Nope. I mean, you nope. just don't, you know. You don't have to have a boat at all. But, but if you're looking for a lawn, a, a Pro V is a good boat. Lund, Lund makes a lot of good boats. I obviously I have some kind of connection here or there and then whatever and, <laughs> and yeah, they're they're a good boat. They are. They're a great boat. Uh, Sonny Parker would like to know: it, Would you hook a bullhead in the anal fin instead of the back when using them for bait? Okay, where depends a lot. Number one on the size of the fish and the size of the hook, and I mean by the size of the fish, size of the bait, and the water conditions. If I'm in a heavy current, you know, I'm going to hook him through the upper lip, not through the lower and the upper, but just through the upper, uh, about, a, you know, whatever, quarter inch back from the, from the lip and straight up with the hook point coming out the top. Uh, just because in the current, if you hook him up through, through the dorsal or through the anal and he gets caught sideways in that current, the current's going to kill him. It's going to drown him. That's right. Uh, um, but if, if the current isn't, or you're putting him in a quiet or hole. Um, if the hook will not, here's the problem. When you when you have, here, let's face, here's the fish body, right? And you put your hook on this fish, on the top of this fish. When you hook him up, the hook comes up like this, right? But as mm -hmm. soon as you put it in the water, the hook goes like this, you know? The hook tip goes down all of a sudden. If the side of that hook or the tip of that hook is, going to pierce the side of that fish the bait's too big for the hook then i would go to the anal fin because then the tip of that hook is going down low when that when that line tips over the hook is going to point down so either way whatever you're comfortable with but just just make sure your tip flats are not scared of a hook tip i know it used to be the rule you know cover the hook up hide the hook all this kind of stuff if you hide the hook you don't get a hook set on that's don't right. hide the hook. They don't care. Nope. When they're feeding, they're picking up sticks. They're picking when they go charging down on a fish. They pick up sticks. They pick up rocks. They don't care. The hook isn't going to spook him. No, they don't even know what a hook is or lead weights or anything like no, that. No, no, they don't. No. You know, they're going after the smell or the vibration of the bait that you have in the water. Uh, yep. They're not at all worried about that other stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, the guy that was asking a question, Jerry was asking a question a while ago about the salty. Salties are baby carp. They get them at bait shops and stuff. Okay. Wow. That's cool. I, thank you for giving me that info. I like, <laughs> learn, I, I like learning stuff. I didn't know that. Salt, that's nice. Um, I would think a small, okay, I've never used small carp. Up here, carp are illegal. Just so you know, can't even use them as cut bait legally. Uh, and I don't know why, but you can't. So I'm just saying I'm not that familiar with carp. As far as I'm concerned, personally, I mean, I know what carp are. I know what small carp look like. I would think it'd be a great bait. If that's what the question is, I think it'd be a great bait. If it's legal, if it's legal to use where you're at, it'd be a great bait. 
and, and I agree they, they eat them all the time they are legal bait in my area and lots lots of other areas but I know up north they have some different outlooks on that uh, we've already covered where to hook the bullheads uh, deepest water you would fish for flatheads on a river hmm I think deep is that sort of, but let's try it again. Okay. Did you want to address that again? Oh, I'm sorry. The, deep, okay. the, deep, the deepest water on a river, would I fish? That would depend on what was in that water. It really would. It, I mean, if, if you've got a 20 foot hole, you got a 30 foot hole. Um, and you've got cover underneath there. You've got some elements built up in there, you know, some, some sunken trees or whatever. Uh, because the oxygen levels will stay good in a river. Everything keeps rolling over. That can hold fish. Um, I don't think I would go much over 30 feet, though. I really don't. I just, I just am not a believer in deep water and flatheads. You know, when you get down at 50 foot and deeper, I just, I just think I can find – I think I could beat you in a tournament in shallow water. I think you're right. Sonny Parker would like to know what's your opinion on using mud puppies for bait for flatheads? <clears throat> uh, we've doing it well. Okay, we don't have a true mud puppy up here, but we have those is, is the tiger salamander larva, but everybody calls them mud puppies or water dogs. Um, they'll catch flatheads. The only problem I've had with them when I've used them, and they work great, but they try to hide. I mean, they will continually hide on you. If they can get under something, uh, they do it. So you got to kind of watch that. I mean, if you're around any kind of cover, got sticks on the bottom or anything, they will get into it and get under it, especially rocks. You'll never get your hook back. <laughs> exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, what's the best area to catch bullheads? Uh, I, I don't know if you guys know what a slough is, if you call it a slough. Um, shallow kind of mud bottomed small bodies of water with some bulrushes or the shallow ends of some lakes along weed lines. Uh, bullheads are, at least up here, bullheads are in every body of water we have. You have a yellow bullhead, a brown bullhead, and a black bullhead. They all work equally. Um, you know, but, but basically for bullhead, you're going to look for muddy bottom. It's going to be a little better for you. Muddy bottom along some weed lines or muddy bottom with some bulrushes. Uh, again, shallower water. Yeah. Good night crawler. You'll catch them. Yep. One of the one of the best places in my area to get them is small farm ponds that yeah. people use for uh, raising cattle or used to keep all the stuff around that nothing yeah. else lives. A bullhead will live in that. And oh, yeah. they yeah. usually are very easy to catch, like say. Uh, just a piece of uh, night crawler on a hook, and you're usually good to go. Yep, yep, absolutely. If you're drifting a reservoir, would you use cut bait or live bait? For a flathead, live bait. Yep. I don't even have to think about that. I know people catch them on cut bait, but live bait. I want it putting out vibration. Vibration's 50% of it. So, yeah, definitely live bait. Yep, I agree. I just seen one I wanted to make sure that I got to you, and now I can't find it. Um, where did she go? Oh, there it is. K-Bug Clark wants to know, what's your favorite fishing rod? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? I can't say that, Lyle. <laughs> I, I use a lot of different rods. Um, just because of kind of what I do, uh, I, I, I use uh, Flugers, I use St. Croix, I use, uh, I don't know if I should be naming all these or not. I mean, I, I, use, <laughs> I, use, I use a lot of rods. Um, I, I think that would depend what, I, what I'm doing. I mean, if I want to go with something that, that everybody can do, I guess I'd say probably a Shakespeare ugly stick. I know some people don't like them, but but they're a good rod. You can get them in a lot of different powers, different right. lengths, spinning, casting. They're, they're basically affordable. Uh, and I'll be honest, they're very durable. So yep. I guess if that's, if you're looking for a recommendation for something that's just available to everybody, I would probably say, take a look at that. Yep. Uh, Zachary Pence would like to, you to explain what a bull rush is. Uh, bull rush, <clears throat> cattail, if that makes sense. 
A bulrush is a, it, like a cattail. Uh, they're, they're tall, upright grasses in the water, basically. They're, they're very, almost like a stick, but they're green. Sometimes they have like a little cotton knob on top. Uh, cattail, bulrush, I don't know how else to describe it. That's, that's about it. If you would look it up uh, in the dictionary, it'll show you a picture. Uh, they grow in big beds, like they can cover a whole bay on a lake, or they can cover, they only go out to certain depths though. You won't find bulrushes in deep water, usually out to about eight foot. All right. All right. Uh, I got rid of a guy while we was talking about that. Harry Atkins would like to know what you think about demon dragons or rattle type baits uh, when you're fishing flatheads. Okay. Um, the demon dragon idea uh, obviously works. I don't know if you're familiar with a Carolina rig. It, it's, it's a similar situation. You're, simp you're simply elevating the bait off the water, usually used when you're drifting. Um, and they work great. They do. They put your bait, you know, depending on your speed and the length of your leader, you can adjust, you know, your bait can ride six inches or two foot off the bottom. Um, yeah, they're good. Rattles. Possibly, unless you're in turbulent water, like where there's a lot of noise going on. I don't know how well the fish pick them up. But if you're like vertical fishing or drifting over a, a stump stump area or some, some something in a reservoir and you got a rattle on there, I, I think it could add to it. It at least attracts some attention. Absolutely. Uh, yep. One of the things that I have said uh, two or three different times, Ted, and, and I, I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, but the demon dragons and the rattles, I think, are a huge benefit when we're lake fishing because the water is basically still and it's a lot more clear than on river systems. And they work so much better for suspending the bait up off of the bottom than the foam floats do. They, they last forever. And yep. Any noise that they make is just a benefit. But now fishing the big rivers and stuff with heavy current, I don't know how far they can hear that stuff. I don't know how far they can uh, feel the vibration. But in my opinion, I think the vibration off of that stuff is more important than the noise. Oh, absolutely. It is the vibration. Yep, it is. Absolutely. That's no question. It, yeah, it, it's the vibration. Yeah, you send your sound waves through the water and is what they're picking up is the vibration off of that. I, I agree with that. I believe that is for sure the the answer. Uh, what temperatures do flatheads start actively hunting live bait fish? Uh, okay, up here we're running about oh, 58 to 60 degrees is when they start really pumping along. Uh, and they'll go, yeah, I would say 58 to 60. I, I'll start thinking about it. Now, do you think that makes any difference, Ted, if they're younger or smaller fish or bigger fish? Yes. I, I, well, I do. I, I think younger fish, just because of numbers, get become more aggressive. Uh, you know, it's just kind of the way mother nature is. If you look at like these small, small channel cats in lakes, I mean, you can't keep them off Well, they're fighting with each other. You got 10,000 of them out there and they got to fight for everything they can get. I think a small flathead will probably just like at night. I think a small flathead will come become active a little quicker than, than a big flathead just because they got to go out there and get food. Yep. I agree. Um, Dieter, I missed your, I must've missed your pony health tail question. And that's pretty rare because you have <laughs> on the ponytail questions, but I must have missed it somehow. Asked if Terry had oh, well, no, Terry had one or Ted had one. Ted had one. <laughs> I don't know if Ted's got a ponytail or not. There you go. There, there you go. There you go, man. I, I, I used to have that, but not for a long time. Yeah. Well, see, my wife likes it, so I'm kind of stuck with it. Uh, I understand. Do you prefer yeah. braid or mono for flathead fishing? Um, I, I go with mono. Uh, and my biggest reason is when I get big fish up to the boat, I'm talking 30 plus, I like to have a little give. Braid gives doesn't give me any uh, forgiveness, I guess I'll call it. Uh, you know, a, a good mono, you know, 40 pound mono will, will give you some forgiveness. It's strong. Uh, you know, and if you look, and some people say, well, that, I don't know if that's heavy enough line. Well, how much poundage does your reel have for drag? I mean, you know, 40 pounds is awful heavy if you're going to deadlift it. <laughs> you know, it really is. That's right. um, 
you know, you can land a 200 pound, well, you can land a 500 pound fish on 40 pound line in open water, you know. Um, I like mono. I, I just like the forgiveness. When they get up to the boat, you, you have some forgiveness when that fish starts spinning on you and he starts going down, diving on you and stuff. You got a little forgiveness. That's yep. all. And I'm just the opposite. I, I don't like any stretch in my line whatsoever. I want yep. to drag on the reel to do its job. It's what it's designed to do. And I want the action of the rod to do its job. If it if both of those do what they're designed to do, you'll never break anything. Yep. And it'll work perfect but if you can't keep from tightening there's no reason for a reel to have 80 pounds of drag no there isn't I mean, there's no. no reason for that you know 8 10 12 at the most 15 pounds of drag yep. all i ever use and if you ever have someone pulling on one set at 15 pounds you got to really hang on to it yeah I'll, I'll tell you a secret about drag or not we're not a secret but but a number of years ago i was fishing a tournament uh, i wasn't fishing with phil king but He's a friend of mine, or I consider him a friend anyway. I don't know if he called me a friend, but I, but I call him a friend. And we were talking about, and, and he said he's the max he sets drag on his reels is five pounds. Right. That's it, five pounds. Because if you get a big fish, you want that stuff to be able to do its job. You want right. you want that rod and reel to be able to fight that fish. Yep. You know. And anyway, five pounds. That's it for for Phil. You probably know a really good guy that I think the world of by the name of Harold Dodd. I heard it. I can't say I met the gentleman. Okay. Well, Harold is the guy that when Phil King caught the 105, uh, yeah. Harold caught the 108. One, one of them caught one of them. The other caught the other. The yeah, day no, in that no. tournament in Memphis a few years ago. And yeah, Harold that, told me that he never, ever sets his drag anywhere from 8 to 12 pounds. He said, if you can't take the drag off the reel, you just might as well have a winch on there because there's not, no benefit to having a reel with the drag system. You're right. Yep. And both those fish were caught in the same tournament. Yep. That's exactly right. One day yep. apart. Yep. Yep. Uh, Harold Dodd is, is one of the great unknown cat fishermen in the sport. Uh, he, he's just a really cool guy. We still got new people coming in. Man, <laughs> this has been a great show, Ted. I, a world of information and. Uh, the, the amount of questions in the chat tonight has been absolutely phenomenal, and every one of them got answered. I hope so. I tried. Unless I uh, missed one. Well, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> you know the, the questions, the, the whole thing about answering questions like that, though, Lyle, is that bodies of water change. You know, everybody, right. every body of water cha changes, and more importantly, every angler's preference changes. You like braid, I like mono. Some people right. like spinning reels, some people like bait casters. And they will all catch fish if they're used properly. That's so, correct. So, you know. we had, I, I'll tell you right quick, in case you missed it on Facebook today, uh, Aaron Wheatley had made a post about he's having trouble with hookup ratios when he's back mounting fish. Um, I, I agree with 90% of what was said on there because uh, for a circle hook to work, and a lot of people like to do that with a circle hook, when you have to let that hook load up and lay off of it and then reel down on the fish. The problem with that theory is, and why I use Gamagatso Big River hooks is, when that fish strikes, the excitement is so great because he's trying to take that fishing rod out of your hand while you're drifting mm -hmm. backwards. You're trying to hold on yeah. to the damn thing, and the first thing you're going to do is set the hook. So why would you have a circle hook when you know that's going to jerk it right away from you? <laughs> yep. Big River Gamagatsus, he's stuck before he knows it. Yep, yep. Now, and that, Cindy and that, uses the uh, circle hooks because they work better for her. I'm sorry? Cindy uses the uh, circle hooks because they work better for her. Well... It's it's how you use it then you know that's, that's exactly right you know how how you prefer to use it I in that case I would use just a, a more not a circle hook because I I would be trying to set the hook he he he, he puts my rod tip down I want to hit him back right away and, you know and, and that's not the right way to use the circle hook so I have to go the right way. I, I know that you probably got other stuff to do with but I got I got to go back to something you said earlier. Uh, when you was asked about the type of hooks that you use, and you said something to the fact that you have your own type of hook. Did you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't design it, but but I, I adopted it. it. It's an eagle claw hook. It's not an expensive hook, but 
but I've used it for years and years and years before I even realized, you know, a lot about it. And my hookup percentage is just huge. Uh, the only problem is the size is limiting, uh, but it, it's kind of a cross. It's an offset. It's a straight shank offset. Uh, it's a wide gap, and yet it's a semicircle. Semicircle. Uh, you can set or let the fish go. Uh, it has an offset, but my hookup rate is just huge on it. The only problem, like I said, is the size. It goes up to four aught. On the good side of that, a four aught. And I don't know why it is, but a four out. If I take a, a six hot like Gamagatsu, my four out is just as big as their six out. Right. So, so it's an oversized hook. But but I've had fish, you know, up in the forties on it. I didn't catch my fifty on them, but I, I've had fish in the forties on them. I've caught you know northerns on them. I've caught just about everything on them, and, and I've never had a problem with them. I, I just like them. That's all. I got faith in them, so I use them for years and years and years. Um, my favorite hooks in the world, and if I could was having problems, I always went back to an Eagle Claw 2022 and an L197. Uh, yep. and they have amazing hookup ratios. Yep, the 97 is a semicircle, isn't it? Um, the 197, I think. I believe it is. Yes. Yep. Yep. Now, it really, as of recently, I've been testing uh, James R. Woods' new circle hooks, but they're not new. They're new to me. Uh, there you go. Give me some of the hooker's terminal tackle ones. Now, these are extremely sharp. I mean, they really are sharp. And with our testing, their hookup ratio is just as good, uh, or if, at least as good, maybe better. We, we've been doing really well with them, and we really, really like them. So I got to say that James has, has hit the home run with uh, the Reapers and, and uh, the other hooks that he's got. Yep, yep. Welcome to Catfish Weekly, Doc Lang. Hey, thanks. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. We're coming live <laughs> from Lake of the Ozarks. <laughs> well. Took me all this time to figure out my password <laughs> on Google. Because <laughs> I'd, never, I'd never used my phone before to uh, try to get in on, on the chat area so <laughs> well uh we've been running on here almost two hours as you well know doc but uh unless ted's in a hurry if you have any questions for the man now would be a good time to get them on out there oh no i i won't bother him that much uh i'm i'm real anxious to go back and see the entire uh uh video so looking forward to that Thanks for being on the show, Ted. Well, thank you. I hope you have a good trip. Me too. Yep. The weather's beautiful down here right now. It's 85 down here, so, and it, it's up in the 80s right now, and it's pitch dark outside. Yeah, it is, but uh, it's going to be a great weekend for the national championship. Everybody's going to be here. It's going to be having a lot of fun, and um We've been telling everybody all year how easy the bait is to get. And now it's a, for some reason, all of a sudden, it's a little tough. You guys coming in from out of state must have scared the hell out of them, Shad. Evidently. <laughs> so we'll be up in the morning trying to find some. Well, that'd be great. Uh, Jerry, I don't know what the water temperature is down there. I, I haven't been out for a few days, and Doc hasn't been out yet. But uh, send him a message tomorrow afternoon. He can probably tell you what the water temperature will be then. Well, Ted, I, I want to thank you for your second seminar with us on Catfish Weekly. It means so much to us that you would come on and spend virtually two hours with us helping people catch more flathead catfish. And let's face it, they're the king of cats, and who doesn't want to catch them? Yep. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I hope we helped somebody. I gave somebody some ideas. Anyway. I'm quite sure he did. Now, if people want to get in touch with you or find out more about your videos or books and stuff, how can they do that? Um, okay, Amazon, like I say, Amazon uh, Prime is, is the big place for us. Uh, eBay, uh, I have, well, okay, tedellenbecker.com will be live in about a week. Awesome. And, and absolutely everything will be 
up and running on there as far as info. And and people, I, I will invite you now, if you have questions when this website comes up, uh, feel free, uh, email me. I will answer your emails. Uh, if it takes a day or two, don't get mad. It just takes a while sometimes, but I will answer questions or just talk to you. I, I'm try to be friendly. You know, if you see me on the water, please come up and say hi. I don't bite. And uh, yeah. So anyway, tedalwinebecker.com in 10 days. About awesome. Awesome. Eight to 10 days. Now, Ted, I want to extend an offer to you that anytime you feel like you have information you would like to share to the catfishing world, I've given you an open invitation to come on our show and be part of it because the last two trips that you've been in here has been amazing with the information that you shared with our viewers. Well, well, thank you. And I appreciate the invite. I, I will probably take you up on it maybe by the end of the summer again. We have a project we're working on, and I, I won't go into detail, but we do have a, a really good one uh, that, that we're working on right now that would that will translate into a seminar. We're doing a video of it, but we're going to translate it into a seminar as well. Outstanding. I, you know, one of the things, Ted, that people have forgot about over the years, they worry about catching flatheads and they worry about catching big blues. Um, somebody should do a study on the mature big channel cats. Oh, for sure. The big chat. Well, how many channel cat fishermen are there? Millions, <laughs> you know, and, and, and channels are, are popular and they're available. And uh, we will be actually doing a video on channel cats this summer. I, oh, I can't wait to see boy, it. It's amazing you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I didn't actually, honestly, I didn't know about, about yeah, the video yeah. that you're doing, but um, Cindy and I love to fish channel cat tournaments. We don't really have that many in our area, but we go to northern Missouri and Illinois, uh, up into Iowa to a lot of channel cat water and fish tournaments up there. And uh, I enjoy it very much. Uh, weight ends are close, you know, the weights are close. and and you catch a lot of fish. Yep, yep. You have fun. They're fun fish. And and boy, I'll tell you what. You put a twenty pound channel on the end of a, a nice medium action rod, and you got a fight. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, yep. yep. They'll, they'll rip you up. Take a bunch of high dollar gear to catch them. Yep. You just yep. go out and put them in the boat. Yep. Have fun with them. They're good eating if you want to do that, and they're they're good sport fish if you just want to do the fight. That's that's exactly right. And they're well, usually willing. <laughs> Oh yeah, they're they're usually not ter now. The big ones are a little different, but usually you can catch down. Yep, yep, yep. Normally, yep, absolutely. Well, listen, Ted. Thank you again. Uh, please stay in touch, and I can't thank you enough for being a part of our show tonight, and a lot of great information. And we're looking forward to getting with you later on in the year. You bet. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. All right. Talk thanks to you so later, much. Doc. Doc. You're going to want to go back and rewind this one. Yeah. Oh, I know I will. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great show. For sure. A lot of lot of quality information and a lot of questions in. Good deal. I want to go over something that, that people don't, don't realize. Um, I noticed that we didn't quite get as many people sign up for the Regret Prize Wheel this week. And I think some of the reason is because uh, of our new website and they didn't want to go sign up. Well, we've taken some of the things off where now you only have to put your name in and your uh, um, email. Email, I believe it is. I haven't, I, you guys have no idea what I've been going through the last couple of days. But anyhow, I wanted to go over the reason why we've done that. Um, the reason why we're doing that is at some point we can build up the base of, of how many we got, of how many people come in and listen to the show or watch the show or sign up every week. And the main reason is because I spend hours on end copying and pasting everybody's name to keep track of that. And I don't have 30 hours a week to spare to do that. And that's why we've done it. I can what? go. Yeah, really. I can go <laughs> to this database doc and pull it up and copy and paste all of the names at once. And put Yeah, that's a whole lot easier than trying to grab everything on Facebook on Tuesday mornings. I will make usually make a post about who our guest is going to be for the following week. And I don't get anything done that day, the next day. And 
several hours of each day after that, besides the phone calls and messages and all the other stuff that we do, it's, it's just it will not to be too much. So that is why that is so important. Also, your emails and stuff, if we get ready to do special things and limited deals that everybody else don't know about, if somebody comes up with a new product or a special price at some point, that when you start getting those emails, you know there's a deal to be ahead. And that's a lot of the reason why we wanted uh, the database. And besides, we need to know how many people are watching every week or every other week and, and stuff like that. But just to alleviate probably 15 hours or more a week for me having to do that, it was worth the effort. So please understand, I just don't have that much. Uh, Rick Montoya says, Doc, if you need fresh shad, add me on Facebook. Lake Cozart is really close or within an hour. And then he's Hold on. Cool. That um, very nice. Very nice. Who was that? Uh, Rick Montoya. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rick. Yes, Bottom Dollars Outdoors. As of now, you will need to sign up every week uh, until we get a, a large enough database. Now, what we do is uh, we go through and take out all the duplicates. And, and retain how many that way we can monitor how many people's watching the show. Yes, Dieter, it was a long show, but it was a lot of knowledge here shared, uh, and I think people will be happy with that. Hey, Doc. Yep. Since you're here, how about we spin that old rig wrap prize wheel? All right. Number three. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, excuse me. You haven't heard this yet. Hang on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Number three. Let's get one. Two. And three. And the winner is Kayla Burton. What can we do for Kayla this week? Mm -hmm. And Kayla. You have won some structure snakes from Rusty Jackson. If you'll contact them on Facebook, they will send those babies out to you. And, Doc, i got to tell you, those structure snakes, we pulled them for, what, eight or ten hours yesterday? Yeah. Never lost one. Never lost one, huh? Never lost a one. We had three. Two. Hung out. Hung out. Oh, yeah, we had two or three different weights that we was trying from the, the lightest one that he had sent us to the heaviest one he sent us. And they would, they, you could tell that they'd stick in a stick or something every once in a while, but every one of them came loose on their own, and we continued with our business uh, while we was out on the lake. So, very impressive. Yep. yep. Good. You guys are, are in, in the market for a drifting weight. Contact Rusty Jackson. The structure snakes are Catfish Weekly approved. Very good. Good deal. Hey, so, I can do a doc's tip. Oh, well, let's have one, man. All right. Well, earlier in the year, I told everybody, you know, when you're checking your bearing, your bearing hubs and stuff like that, to uh, get one of the little radar guns, the temp guns that uh, tells you your uh, temp of your hubs. The one thing I failed to mention was uh, generally your hubs should run 30 degrees hotter than what ambient temperature is, and you're well within the limits. So... If it's 70 degrees outside, it's not unusual for your hubs to be running 100 degrees. So, but uh, generally, 100. If, if they get up to 160, you're having an issue with your hubs. So, uh, that, that's just a, a little tip there for all of you that uh, shoot your hubs when uh, you're traveling. And, and I travel a long ways, and so uh, uh, I really keep an eye on my hubs. So, and that's Doc's tip for the night. And Doc, I know you check yours frequently because you stop frequently as we do. And I know every time you stop, you check them. Yep, every I time. Do, I do too. And, and a lot of guys do that. And if you don't have one of those electronic devices like Doc was telling about to check them with, lay your hand on that hub. You will be, it's easy to tell if it, one of them's hotter than the rest of them because yeah. you, it's going to go when you hit it. Yeah. 
you know, not you, burning your fingers. Yeah, you're going to think you, it's going to. So. And the other thing you need to tell Missouri, they need more rest stops because they don't have hardly any of them. You are correct. Illinois is really good about that. And with all the things that yeah. I don't like about Illinois, I love their rest stops. They're nice. clean and nice. Uh, you're you're not afraid to stop there. They have people in them things all the time, and we go through Illinois a lot, going to tournaments and stuff. And I very much like those. Arkansas's are very nice, as as is the ones we've stopped at in Tennessee and Kentucky. But Missouri yeah. are not bad. They're just not often. Seventy and forty-four is the yeah. only ones. Yeah, if you're not on Highway seventy or forty-four, you probably are not going to find too many. No, uh, there wasn't any on fifty-four, and you know. So, yep. No, none on 54. Uh, once in a while, you'll see on 54, you will see a uh, uh, picnic table or something, but that's about the extent of it, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, we saw we saw Rex on 54. We saw, <laughs> actually, we saw several of them. I'm pretty sure of that. You know, overturned truck, and then there was a like a eight car pile up there, right past. Is that the Missouri River that we crossed over? Yes, it is. Okay, it was right past the Missouri River. There was big pile up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Kind, of, kind of common thing in there. Doc, I talked to you about this earlier, but I want to go over this. I, you know, I, as bad as I hate people laughing at me, uh, <laughs> we have had uh, the last couple of weeks just been unbelievable. Up three or four o'clock in the morning working on stuff and trying to get things going and messages and phone calls constantly throughout the day for this tournament that's coming up, and we're so glad that you're here, Doc, safely. Um, but we run into an issue a few days ago with hornets, big, mean, <laughs> ass hornets under our shed. I uh, hate them things. I went through how many cans of hornets? Four, four or five. I was buying them in the double pack, and you could spray them, and all you did was piss them off. They didn't, they didn't even look her up <laughs> one side or the other. They just come flying at you, and you're trying to swat them away. So, Are those the black hornets? Well, they're black, but they got a little red, a little yellow, yellow on their head, and a little bit okay. on their back. But they're just mean bastards. So we can't we can't kill them, you know. And I know we just got that shed and uh, last year, so we know that they're trying to build a nest up underneath there. So I decided, and I'm glad Cindy didn't figure out how to videotape this. I got a, a bait net. Uh, it's got a probably an eight foot handle on it, and if you go out there and when they stop moving and take them like that, and you get them in that net, you can go in and step on them and smash them suckers, and and they're right there. And ball face hornets, that's exactly what they are. And um, I have a pile of them beside that shed. I don't know how many's in there, and I hope it doesn't take all summer. But if Nothing else is we found to kill the damn things. I've been a net, dip netting them and stepping on them, and as long as I don't get stung, I'm gonna continue to do it. Now, uh, if you guys see a weird video, if Cindy puts <laughs> one, up, it'll be that. But now, a while ago, Doc, we was out there and I was after these things, and my daughter was holding my dog, and you know how big she's got. She got yeah. come running over there by me. And she hit me with her head in the mouth, and now I got a fat <laughs> lip on top of it, and it wasn't even from the hornets. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you only got a couple hundred more hornets to kill. I mean, if it's a normal, if it's a normal nest, you got about two or three hundred hornets. You still got to kill yet. Oh, so, problem, you're going to be busy all summer. The problem is, I'm sure that nest is right underneath there, uh, between the floor joists. But it's only this much room, and I don't want too much of me underneath there. <laughs> no, I, I'm with you on that carburetor spray. There's not too much that carburetor cleaner spray and brake cleaner won't kill. I'm convinced of that. But if I get my big old butt down there and they come swarming out of there, I ain't sure I can get up fast enough to get away from them. I will video it. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad it's a new shed because fire will really clean them out real quick. I tell you. I don't want to test out the insurance, but them babies got to go one way or the other. <laughs> you can't walk the dog without them coming around you, and I'm afraid that one of the grandkids or something will get into them. So, so we're working on this, but I thought maybe some of you guys would, would get a kick out of that. Don't forget Kenny McClure's uh, mother. If you find it in your hearts to help these folks out, uh, they could really use the assistance. And Kenny and Becky, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you guys. You have done so much to help 
not only Catfish Weekly out, but many, many other people throughout the time that I've known you. And uh, hopefully we can give uh, you a little assistance to help you out with this. It's been a great show, Doc. Uh, we really missed you. It was hard to keep up with, with all the questions and stuff. But Cindy done a pretty good job tonight. Uh, good deal. Out. Doc has the countdown because I didn't know. Oh, yeah. Count. Somebody asked about the countdown Dave's in the tournament. Version. Dave wanted to know if you had the countdown. Hang on, man. I figured you did. If I, if I don't lose you on this phone, you still there? Sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> For the national tournament? Yes, sir. Four days, seven hours, 58 minutes and 46 45 44 seconds <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't <clears throat> i wasn't sure doc that you would make it uh, i didn't know uh, how far you was and when you started in on the tip for the night i thought oh no he's done had he done had bearing problems again. No, 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 no. It was, it was a great trip. Uh, had no problem. It, how long did it take us, Lynn? Ten hours. Ten hours. Our time. Ten, ten hours our time to get down there. So that's that's. Uh, and we like stopped. We stopped and had lunch, and then I think we filled the truck up. I was real pleased with the truck, uh, getting about thirteen miles a gallon hauling that big boat. So I'm pretty, pretty pleased with it. Uh. Bradley Young says he'll be down there tomorrow. Oh, Bradley will be? He'll be down there tomorrow. Now, Jerry and his partner are coming up from Texas. They'll be here in a few days. Uh, not too much. Jason, many. Mathena's already here. Oh, is he? Really? Yeah, yeah he's already here. He was a, we When we checked in, the motel operator was asking, yeah, he's already been asking about you. So. <laughs> Well, you and Jason will have a good time visiting over the next few days, I'm quite sure. Um, hopefully, we're going to make a trip past there tomorrow. Uh, if we get everything wound up and done up in time, uh, I've been, as, as you know, we've been waiting a long time on our boat. It's been done, and I haven't had a chance to get it. And we're going up in the morning, bright and early, to pick it up so we can get back and I can try to get some more stuff done. Uh, Doc, we've got a living room full of prizes from fishing rods to tackle and hooks. My gosh, we it's awesome. We got, a, we got a bunch of stuff and a bunch more stuff coming from guys that um, I talked to Jerry Klein. He was sending a package out from Tangle with Catfish. Um, they was I talked to a gentleman with B and M uh, rods the other day, and he is he told me he would send a package out today. Uh, I hope it, it makes it in time for the tournament. Uh, that will be just that much more, but we have a lot of cool stuff that we're going to share with everybody. And, and the temperature is going to be great. They've been running water. Hopefully that will continue. So it should be a great time at the Lake of the Ozone. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. We'll, we'll see how it goes tomorrow. Yeah, I'm sure you'll be bright, bright and early. And uh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> this old man, it's hard to get up that early <laughs> well, after being on the road this long. Did you do all the driving? Yeah. I, I wondered if you didn't. Yeah, I didn't switch out. I felt pretty good, so I just kept it going. That's cool. Who is cool. going to be up at 2 a.m. to see us? Oh, Jerry says, who's going to be up at 2 a.m. to see you roll into town? Probably not me. <laughs> I've, been up, I've been up to 2 to 4 in the morning every morning. Except one for the past week and a half. Chad so. Milk said he'll be there uh, Thursday, Thursday or Friday. Friday. Chad Milk will be there Thursday so or Friday. There's a bunch of us going to be rolling Thursday. in. So we're supposed to get there Thursday, but we want to get everything done and get the boat, get some pictures taken, and, and uh, get all that done. And, and uh, yeah, and then load everything up because, uh, you know, there's just too much uh, overwhelming us. And some of the stuff that we plan on getting done, this thing will make it. That's just. I'm sorry, but that's the way it works. I'm not a kid anymore, believe it or not. I am. No. Oh. Nope. Doc's so, gone, no. Oh, there he is. Nope, I'm still here. Uh, my, so, my I'm glad I got to make it in here. I wasn't oh. sure if I was ever. Man, I kept trying password after password, and I'd never tried it on this new phone I got. And then finally, I, I said, well, I'll try this one, and boom, it popped in. Perfect, man. 
Perfect. Well, I'll be looking forward to seeing if everything goes right uh, tomorrow or Thursday if you're around. Okay. You come back through. If not, it'll, it'll probably be Thursday. And uh, you guys find a bunch of fish. We're looking forward to seeing everybody up there this weekend. And uh, for Doc Lang and Cindy Stokes, I'm Lyle. And thanks for watching Catfish Weekly. We will see you next Monday night at 7 Central.